Uh, for those of you all that I haven't had a chance to meet, uh, I am Eric Robine, and uh, my wife Sally, who's here, and I have been visiting your church for over the past several months, and uh, have uh, been blessed by the service, been blessed by the fellowship, and uh, by the grace of the Lord, uh, I've been invited to say a few words today about the U.S. Constitution and the Christian roots of the Constitution. I'm sorry that Ryan and Gideon are sick and Ryan wasn't able to be preaching today. I've thoroughly been blessed by Ryan's preaching. Uh, so I am a poor substitute for your regular preacher. But uh, I, will, I will stand in here uh, as a deep bench pick here at the last minute <laughs> under duress. So, so uh, I, uh, I am very thankful always for an opportunity to, uh, uh, to speak on the topic of the Constitution and especially on the topic of the Christian roots of our nation. So let me uh, first, uh, since I want to uh, uh, fulfill the, my responsibilities here with the pastoral prayer, uh, just please ask for your forgiveness if I do not open up for prayer requests directly from you, but I, would, I will offer a couple of minutes of silent prayer for your particular individual petitions, and then I will go into the, the pastoral prayer, if, that's, if that meets your approval. That way I, I, I'm unable to, to name names and remember names. My memory is not as good as it used to be, if it was ever any good. Uh, so, uh, so with your permission, let us open up then with a silent prayer for those petitions that you have individually, and then I will step in with pastoral prayer. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Please pray with me. Our Father, you alone are worthy, our sovereign, our creator, our sustainer, our redeemer and judge. It is such a blessing that we can come before the throne of grace with our individual petitions and you promise that you will hear them. In fact, you know them before we even speak them. You are a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in your being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. You alone are good. Your loving kindness is everlasting. Your faithfulness extends to all generations. You alone are full of grace and truth. Apart from you, we can do nothing. You're the vine and we're the branches. Forgive us. We are but dust. Forgive us for what we have said and done that we should not and have left undone that which we should have done. For failing to speak the truth in love, for remaining silent when we should have spoken out, for failing to take action in the face of fear and doubt, for failing to do justice, love kindness, and to walk humbly with you. Father, we rejoice with the psalmist who says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. We thank you for your grace and your mercy that's new to us each morning, your sustaining providential hand in our lives in countless ways. 
and our hearts are filled with gratitude for your son Jesus whom you sent that he might suffer and die on the cross and then by his blood we would be saved giving us new life in him in his resurrection and we thank you father that you have adopted and called your elect your children with the sure hope of eternal life in Christ father we lift up st. Paul's congregation uh, we pray for uh, the health concerns of each one here in the extended families those who are not with us this morning uh, we lift up especially Ryan and Gideon that they might be restored to health quickly we lift up all the challenges and the problems and issues uh, in families and at work and within the community we know that there are things that are happening that uh, that are not right and pleasing in your eyes and we just pray that even now your Holy Spirit would be working those things out in a way that is pleasing in your eyes we pray your blessings on Caleb and Mary Ellen Curry as they take up their call as to missionary work in uh, Togo uh, we pray for their the funds to be released and for them to be completely uh, prepared uh, educated and trained in, in what they need to do before they depart here and that their mission there would be successful in every respect father we pray for your church worldwide your people especially those in areas of persecution around the world we pray for their protection we pray for success in the missions that you've given them father we pray for our own nation all those in authority that you have placed uh, over us we pray for uh, a cessation of the unrest and the disunity the lawlessness that we have witnessed and pray that your spirit would even now be working to resolve those issues in a way that is pleasing in your eyes we pray for the upcoming election that you would raise up leaders who will serve you and support and defend the Constitution based on your word and your eternal truth and even this Supreme Court vacancy that has just arisen that you will raise up a justice who will serve you and fulfill that key role in a way pleasing to you we pray for those who know you that their faith in Christ alone would be strengthened and that faith resting through faith alone by grace alone for those who do not know you yet as Savior and Lord we pray that your Holy Spirit will open hearts minds and eyes to see your truth manifested in your son Jesus Christ so that every knee should bow and tongue confess him as Lord and Savior we are here to worship you in spirit and truth please accept our offerings of praise and worship this morning and in view of your mercy enable us to offer our bodies as living sacrifices holy and pleasing to you let us not be conformed to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of our minds that we'll be able to test and approve your good pleasing and perfect will we thank you father for your promise that your word will not return void may your spirit speak through me and to me and all present this morning in Jesus name we pray amen well quick test what do we celebrate on July 4th independence that's the anniversary of the Declaration of Independence after that declaration was signed our forefathers had to fight a war in order to gain that independence that war wasn't over until 1781 under that declaration of independence there was a constitution of sorts that had been formed by our forefathers called the uh, uh, the uh, I want to make sure I get the correct term right articles of confederation that lasted from 1777 to 1787 the articles of confederation left a lot to be desired we won't go into that today but suffice it to say that by 18 or 1787 
the founding fathers knew that we needed a governing structure structure that could rest upon the base, this firm foundation of the Declaration of Independence in order to protect the rights and the God-given blessings of liberty that the Declaration declared. And that's what the Constitution gave us. It's just last week that there was a special ceremony to honor Staff Sergeant Robert Hartsock, pre, pre, uh, posthumously awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for combat service in Vietnam. I don't know if any of you went to that, other than I think Jim and I were there. Maybe there were some others who had gone, but the uh, man's choice sculptor, Wayne Hyde, did a fantastic job, and it was a wonderful ceremony. And for those of us who served in Vietnam, it was a real blessing for us to understand and to see the, uh, the outpouring of support for him and for our veterans. And in this respect, the outpour outpouring of support for our Declaration and our Constitution as well is always heartening to those of us who have served in the military and have sworn to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. I took that oath well over 51 years ago, uh, and I still believe strongly in it today and still feel myself bound by that oath. Psalm 127 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who work. And as we go through these points here, I'd like to emphasize about our Constitution. I hope that you will see, as I do, how much we owe to the Lord first and then to those men that he raised up to give us this Constitution, this wonderful inheritance that we have accepted and has been passed down to us for us to protect and maintain. Constitution is now 233 years old. It's the oldest and it's the shortest self-governing constitution still in effect in all the world. There are seven exceptional principles of the U.S. Constitution that make it unique, resilient, and enduring. And all of those principles are based on Scripture. Even G.K. Chesterton, famous British theologian, philosopher, and writer, had this to say about our country. America is the only nation in the world that is founded on a creed. These seven wonderful principles are popular sovereignty, republicanism, federalism, individual rights, limited government, checks and balances, and separation of powers. Why is it that we celebrate the Constitution? It's very simple. Just as our Christian faith has been handed down to us covenantally, the Constitution has been handed down to us by our forefathers, and like our faith, it can be lost within a generation unless we know it, understand it, and can defend it and prepare to pass it on to the generations that follow us. It can be gone in one generation. Ink on paper does not work by itself. It takes people determined to live out the truth in order for it to be saved. Listen to the preamble of the Constitution, and I, I won't read the entire Constitution today, although it will just take 30 minutes to go through it, but there are too many other points I wanted to make in addition, and I, and I do have some copies of the Constitution if anybody would like to take one with you. I highly recommend it. If you don't have a copy in your house, it, to me it's like having a copy of the Bible there, you ought to have one available in the house to refer to. 
But listen to the preamble. And then see if you can see in the preamble what it is that the Founding Fathers were saying to us right here today. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Did you catch that? For our posterity. They weren't doing this just for themselves. They put their lives on the line, for sure, but they were doing it for us. So how did this amazing document come about? Well, first, we'll make a, a point about our founders. All of our founders were thoroughly imbued with a biblical worldview from the time they were children, at home, in the church, and in their schools. They studied, guess what? The Westminster Catechism, thoroughly reformed document. They learned it because that was what was being taught primarily in schools and at home and in the church. In fact, interesting statistic, there were four million colonists in America in 1776, and there were five million copies of the catechism that had been published in the colonies. All were well educated, they understood history well, they were men of faith. Literacy in the colonies was well over 80%. Two-thirds of the framers came from Calvinist backgrounds. There were 55 delegates to the Constitutional Convention, 28 Episcopalians, 8 Presbyterians, 7 Congregationalists, 2 Lutherans, 2 Dutch Reformed, 2 Methodists, 2 Roman Catholics, 1 unknown, and 3 classified as deists, among whom Ben Franklin was one but I'll read you a quote from Ben Frank a little bit later, and you tell me if you think that sounds like a deist. So, of these 55, 51 of them were Christians. That's over 93%. 70% were Calvinists, the Episcopalians, Presbyterians, and Dutch Reformed. All of the founders demonstrated a respect for the biblical worldview, regardless of their personal lives or behavior. They all understood how important it was in the life of the colonies and, and in the role of developing a governing document for all people. Christianity was not given supremacy over the other religions. Religious liberty was the key to the founder's faith which meant that all people of all faiths were protected under this amazing document. Now, what is the core principle? What is the at root of the Constitution and what makes it so unique? We live in a fallen world, and because of sin, man cannot be trusted with unchecked power in its simplest terms. James Madison, who is the father of Constitution and also our fourth president, said famously, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. So obviously, we're dealing with fallen, sinful man, and there must be a structure in place in order to check his sinful nature. The amendment process itself recognizes the founders' understanding of human fallibility and their desire to see unborn future generations, us, inherit the blessings of liberty under a government based on the eternal truth of biblical principles. So what effect did that have on the design of the Constitution? Well, one of the first immediate effects was the rule of law replaced the divine right of kings and the rule of man. 
Has anyone heard of Samuel Rutherford before? Anybody? Samuel Rutherford was well respected and read by our colonists, by our, our founding fathers. He was a Scots pastor, Presbyterian, and Sally and I were in Scotland years ago. We visited Anwath, his old church there, and his grave. He wrote the very famous book, Lex Rex, meaning in Latin, Law and King. Essentially, the thesis of this book, which had tremendous impact in the Reformation and on our founding fathers, was that the king is not above the law, that God grants authority through the people to the king. This was a radical, radical idea, that the king only rules, or the king should only rule, through the authority granted by the people. Samuel Rutherford was part of the assembly at Westminster of what's called divines. They were the men who developed the Westminster Confession of Faith, one of the most famous Reformation documents. And if you all haven't had a chance to read the Reformation's most famous document, I strongly recommend it. Beautiful document, but Samuel Rutherford was one of the key writers of the Confession of Faith. It took five years to develop that. Uh, Professor John Murray, a noted scholar, said the Westminster Confession is the last of the great Reformation creeds. No creed of the Christian church is comparable to that of Westminster in respect to the skill with which the fruits of 15 centuries of Christian thought have been preserved and at the same time examined anew and clarified in the light of that fuller understanding in God's word which the Holy Spirit has imparted. Now the Westminster Confession of Faith was published in 1647, more than 100 years before our Constitution was written. 100 years time to allow that to seep into the minds and the souls of our founding fathers and all of our colonists, for that matter. Now, that was 7, 1647. In 1660, unfortunately in England, the king was restored. There had been a brief period of parliamentary rule. The king was restored, and Rutherford was charged with treason, deprived of his church, his university chair, and his pay. They deprived him of all offices and cited him to come before Parliament to answer a charge of treason. At that point, Rutherford was already terminally ill and listen to what he said to the summons. I have got summons already before a superior court and judiciary and I behoove to answer to my first summons and ere your day come, I will be where few kings and great folks come. Death intervened before the charge could be tried, but he died a man unafraid because he was relying completely on God's word. He is buried at St. Mary's College in St. Andrews. And his last words were, I shall live and adore Christ Glory to my Redeemer forever. Glory, glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. He is just one example of the great men who went before our founding fathers and inspired them to develop a structure of government that would govern in a godly way and be a blessing to all generations. Now, as the war wore on, you all may have heard of the Black Robe Regiment. Anybody heard of the Black Robe Regiment during the Revolutionary War? Those were pastors, many of them Presbyterian pastors, who were preaching from the pulpit, and then when that was finished, when they got done with the sermon, they would take off their robes, their black robes, and put on the uniform of Revolutionary Colonial Army 
and go out to fight the British. The battle cry of Americans in 1776 was no king but Jesus. So first key principle was rule of law, not rule of kings and certainly not rule of man. Separation of powers, next principle. Within the central government, executive, legislative, and judicial, which comes right out of Isaiah 33, 22. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king. It is he who will save us. This was an amazing principle that simply wasn't followed anyplace else. The biblical principle of subsidiarity was key in the, in the founders' minds to making sure that issues were solved at the lowest level possible, not at the highest level. Another key principle, checks and balances, where the executive, the president, might be the commander in chief, but it's Congress who funds the military and declares war. Congress passes laws, but the Supreme Court of the United States can declare them unconstitutional. And note, Congress passes laws, not the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court does not make laws. Only the Congress can make laws. And the President signs them if he agrees with them. The Supreme Court is there to judge according to the Constitution. And of course, the Congress can override any veto by the President with two-thirds vote in the House and the Senate. So checks and balances was another key way of checking man's sinful nature. The father, founding fathers saw that clearly. Another key principle, limited government and enumerated powers, allowing for maximum personal liberty and responsibility. The Tenth Amendment of the Constitution ensures that the central government, the federal government, is limited and the states and the people retaining most powers. So the intent of the founders was the central government would be weaker than the states. The states would have most powers and authority. Officeholder terms were limited. President to four years, eight years max. Senators to six years, representatives to two years. And I realize some of these have been, you know, the amendments over the years have modified the presidential term, for instance, to only two terms. Initially, it was unlimited. George Washington, you might recall, served two terms and they wanted him to continue. In fact, they wanted to crown him king. You remember what Washington did? He said, that's why we fought a war. We will have no king. I'm retiring. Separation of the church and state. A lot of times we will hear, oh, that's in the Constitution that there is this no wall of separation written in the Constitution. It's not in the Constitution. The church is protected in the Constitution from state control. The First Amendment makes very clear that we, Americans, have freedom of religion, not freedom from religion. The term wall of separation was in a letter written by Thomas Jefferson to a Baptist church to assure the Baptist church that the government wouldn't interfere with church business. Very clear that we have a church and state separate, very different from England and all the European countries. Freedom of conscience is enshrined in the Declaration. There is no religious test for offices written specifically in the Declaration. Many people have said that the, Declar or the Constitution is a godless document. But there are three references to the Christian faith in the Constitution, four in the Declaration. I won't take time to go through the four, but briefly, in the, in the Constitution, Sundays are accepted in Article 1, Section 7. Sundays are accepted as a non-work day. Article 6 specifically says this was taken, the Constitution was signed in the year of our Lord, 
1787. And then, of course, in the First Amendment, no law establishing religion. The Christian religion being the dominant faith of the founders, although they personally held to this, they believed in freedom of conscience, as I mentioned, so that other faiths could practice as well. Incidentally, if you want to see mention of God in the Constitution directly, read any one of our 50 state constitutions. Every single one of them specifies God as sovereign. Now, one of the things that, that uh, we often use or explain as why the Constitution is so lasting and, and has so much resiliency is it's only been changed 17 times since 1791. There have only been 17 amendments since then. We had the first 10 and then the 17 subsequent, bringing it to 27 amendments. So in 229 years, it's only been changed 17 times. Remarkable resilience. And then the founders made sure, because they were historians, that we did not develop a democracy. They knew how dangerous democracies were and are. When a majority rules, the minority can quickly become victims. And that's why they gave us a constitutional representational republic. Now the University of Houston did a 10-year study and found that there were 15,000 documents from, the Ameri from America's founders and determined that of those documents used in the development of the Constitution, 34% of their quotations came from the Bible, by far the largest number of references. Listen to some of these quotes from our founding fathers. Let me just mention Benjamin Franklin, who many people say was a deist. Listen to what Benjamin Franklin had to say. And have we forgotten that powerful friend who allowed us to defeat Great Britain? Or do we imagine that we no longer need his assistance? I have lived, sir, a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? We have been assured, sir, in the sacred writings, that except the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. I firmly believe this, and I also believe that without his concurrent aid, we shall succeed in this political building no better than the builders of Babel. Now, does that sound like a deist? George Washington said, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. And let us indulge with caution the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. Reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principles. And John Adams, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Adams understood, however, that our Constitution protects those who have other beliefs or claim they have no beliefs better than any other constitution anywhere on earth or in history for that matter. So why have we gone over this? Why do we even concern ourselves with this? Ultimately the question is, as Ezekiel reminds us in 33.10, how shall we now live knowing this? We can live as victims where we claim that our Christian heritage was stolen from us and we might demand our rights. Or we can live as victors in Christ. 
with a full understanding that government cannot save us. We must understand that politics is religion externalized. We vote what we believe, just as we live what we believe. And we need to examine carefully who we vote for and why. Bring it back to biblical principles and make sure that we are thinking the way the Lord expects us to think and then vote that way. There's an old saying that we get the government we deserve. But I think that it's important that we remember that salvation is in the Lord. There are those who believe that their salvation is in the government and they will expend every last penny they have and drop of blood to bring into office those that will do what they want to have done. Our role as Christians is to look to the Lord first because he is sovereign over everything, even politics. And remember that our struggle is not with flesh and blood. And let me just end with Ephesians 6, a wonderful example of what we as Christians should be doing. Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 17. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. It's been a blessing to be with you today, and I would invite all of you to come out and visit White Sulphur Springs, the Officers Christian Fellowship Conference Center right here in Man's Choice. We'd be delighted to have you out there as our guests. Sally and I would be more than happy to show you around and, and meet some of the wonderful staff out there uh, holding forth in this, this godly ministry to our military forces and our military families. Well, please pray with me in his benediction. Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Oh, thank you.